So, we're okay. The people are listening to us. Everything is fine. The other side of the screen. <laughs> so, hello everyone. And my name is Okay, hello everyone, and my name is Andrea, and I am going to introduce to one of the keynotes from the conference. Her name is Anita Grazer, and I am going to tell you a little about her and why she is here. So, um, Anita Grazer is a researcher, open source, he is developer and author. That's right, Anita. That's okay. Okay. She works on at the Austrian Institute of Technology in Vienna, teach Python for cookies in Salvor, and serves on the cookies project steering committee. And she was uh, she has published several books about cookies, including learning cookies and cookies map designing. And in 2020, she was awarded the Osgeo Soil Cats Award. And her latest project is Movie Panda, a Python library from analysting moving data. And this year, Anita won the Women in Tech Award. Fantastic, Anita, will deserve it. So anybody are inter interested in looking for Anita on social network, she was a blog, anitagracer.com. That's right, see? Yeah, that's um, right. On Twitter, under Dark Keys, and LinkedIn, like Anita Gracer. So Anita, and let you start with your presentation about open source for open spatial data science. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks so much for the kind introduction, Andrea. You're welcome. I remove off the screen. Good. So hello, everyone from Vienna. I hope you had a great week already in virtual Buenos Aires. I've certainly picked up a lot of inspiration already, and I'm looking forward to catch up on some of the talks that I missed later in the recordings. It's really an honor to be invited to give the, the closing keynote at Phosphor-G, and I promise I won't keep you too long from the social part of this afternoon or evening or morning, wherever you are. So as you probably know, the speakers are asked to pick their topics quite a bit in advance of an event. So I was very, very excited to see how often open science has already appeared in the previous talks including Silvana's excellent keynote on Wednesday. She has already given an excellent overview of open science, its many different aspects, and the motivation why we need open science. So I hope that in this talk now, I'll be able to give you a complimentary view, maybe from a slightly different angle. So maybe a better title for this talk would have been How Computers Broke Science or and how we can what we can do to fix it at least from a gi science or, or a spatial data science point of view if we want to use a nice new buzzword but what really is the the problem even with computers we all have one and they are great we can do a lot of data analysis using computers that we would not have been able to do with just pen and paper well not all computers are created equal. Many of us data analysts, scientists, we have not received a lot of training on how to share our results in a reproducible fashion, in a way that others could repeat the analysis and come to the same result, or for what it's worth, even sometimes ourselves a few months or years later, we might not be able to really reproduce what we did and uh, remember how we got there. There have been 
some really serious replication scandals, not just in the world of GIS, because we saw a lot of great examples in the past keynotes. Some of them really had far reaching uh, consequences. And it's due to simple things like people using desktop tools that do not um, ensure that the computations are always right, that, that they can re be reproduced very easily. Some of you may remember in 2013, there was this one great scandal about the paper that was called Growth in a Time of Debt, that basically said that the GDP of countries uh, would drop if the debt increased too much. And eventually, uh, people who tried to reproduce these results, because they kept failing to reproduce them, they finally got access to the Excel sheet uh, that was used to calculate these statistics. And they found out, well, that there were quite a couple of mistakes in that Excel sheet. And if we're honest to ourselves, lots of our papers in GI science, they could suffer from similar problems because we use uh, desktop GIS steps, we repeat them multiple times. It's very easy for errors to sneak in and for them to remain undetected, unfortunately, even if the consequences are not necessarily always as dire as in this case, where supposedly it really influenced economic decisions on a grand scale. So reproducibly, reproducibility is really a broad spectrum. There are infinite shades of gray between just putting out a publication stating something saying that those are our findings, believe us, on the one hand side, and full replicability gold standard on the other side. There's so many different shades of gray in between from just publishing the code so that at least people can check that the methodology is correct that there are not no serious flaws with the how things are calculated then of course it's even better if we share both code and data because then people can also try to run the code and see if they come up with the same results if they can get the code to run that is and finally of course it gets even better if it's really well executable, if it, the, uh, the people who are trying to reproduce it do not have to jump through millions of hoops to get it work. So somewhere on this spectrum, I think we are currently trying to position ourselves constantly moving forward, hopefully. And these steps towards moving forward, they are characterized by a lot of trial and error. And I just want to introduce you to three different initiatives that I had contact with over the last couple of years. And of course, this is a completely biased, absolutely non-exhaustive list of examples. And I also noticed that the second one, the FAIR initiative was already mentioned in a couple of uh, other talks as well. So that's great. Um, but I want to introduce you to at least PyOpen Science, to FAIR, and last but not least, to reproducible agile. So let's get started with those. PyOpen Science is an initiative that tries to uh, promote peer review in scientific Python packages. So this is about the code part of open uh, spatial science. They try to create a repository of curated high quality packages uh, where scientists can share their code and can, can reuse the code of others that has been quality uh, checked in this way. And the, one of their goals is to foster a greater sense of community also among scientific Python users and not just have a couple of papers floating around and no immediate connection between people. And I've just copied in a few of the profile pictures of the people involved in this initiative. There's many more, it would have never fit on this uh, slide. But I had a really great experience personally as well. Uh, last year when I submitted the, my Moving Pandas library for a review there, it was a really, really valuable experience. Uh, I found it uh, very uh, rewarding to interact with the reviewers who really checked the code, gave recommendations. They have an extensive checklist of what should be done to ensure that the repository is in a good state, that the code itself is uh, great. Um, and extensible, and 
the licenses are okay. They, they look at all those things. And once you go through this process, I think you also as a scientist, as a producer of the code, can be more comfortable with what you're putting out there and that it will be helpful to others as well. So far, they have 11 accepted peer reviewed packages. Uh, which I think is a great achievement in itself because it really is a lot of work to get these reviews done and to also keep the community growing. So I think they would be very happy also if any one of you wants to reach out, learn more about it, maybe help with this effort. For the second example, for the FAIR, so findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable, mostly applied to data, but also to code. I want to bring an example from a GI science journal, in particular from the International Journal of Geographic Information Science. They have enacted some new journal policies last year, if I'm not mistaken, because they also want to assure that the data and the code that is published together with a journal paper supports reproduction and it, that what is provided by the authors is sufficient for the reproducibility and the replication. They want to uh, eliminate these commonly read statements of the data is available upon reasonable request, whatever reasonable is. So they really ask you to provide uh, links to, for example, platforms like Figshare, uh, to code that is uh, in permanent repositories, so not just GitHub, but really something with a unique identifier um, like Figshare. The only downside I have to say in my experience, and I experienced this from the side of an author, uh, is maybe that they, of course, there's no good time to, to change these rules. So for me, they, uh, changed, updated these rules in the middle of uh, the review of one of my papers, which unfortunately, due to all kinds of project related issues, I wasn't able to share the whole uh, code even after the rules changed. But I think in the future, um, this will be a great initiative provided that the reviewers really follow along and they also use the data that is provided and the code that is provided. Uh, to verify that they can reproduce the results. And that's where I think it gets a bit tricky. And that's where I want to switch to the third initiative to reproducible HL, because they actually have already proof of trying to reproduce papers. In this case, it's conference papers, but they have a team called the reproducibility committee that really goes and sits down, takes the papers and tries to reproduce them and they write reports about them. And this year, it was the second year of operation of this committee. They actually managed to publish reproducibility reports for nine out of 17 papers, uh, full papers that were presented at HL, which I think is already a great success given that some of the other papers, of course, were just conceptual, so there wasn't even any code or data to review. And in some other cases, either the data or the code or both couldn't be shared. But they managed to review more than half of the papers with a team of, as you can see down there, seven people. So you can already see you need quite a lot of people to review these papers and to really work hard trying to find out which parts of the paper can be reproduced. Because, of course, not all of the nine papers are fully reproducible with all the results. In some, it might just be certain parts of the analysis that could be done and others may be failed, which is not necessarily bad science. It's just in the given time before the conference starts. So after the scientific reviews are finished and the conference actually takes place in these couple of weeks, um, we tried to do as much as we could. And on the right hand side, you can see one of the example of a reproducibility review that I wrote. And I, I tried to retrace the steps and included also my versions of the same figures that you could find in the papers. It's fun, but also a lot of work. But if any one of you is interested in that, get in touch. We could always use a bigger team to maybe man, uh, manage to get even more papers reviewed. And how does this even work? How did they achieve uh, this at least 50% papers of the conference reviewed? Well, they have special guidelines for reproducibility. And 
I don't even want you to read all of this because as you can see, it's a lot of different recommendations from minimum requirements to at least give it a try, to at least have some repositability, to really the recommended practices, to what would you expect in an ideal world, how would a reproducible paper for a GI conference look like? And there's a couple of neat mentions because we are at Phosphor-G. Uh, I was super stoked to find that OSG Life is mentioned as one of the environments that could be used to actually provide a um, environment for the reviewer that is the same as the one was, that was used to create the results. And of course, also in the tools used, the recommendation is to use or create open source tools instead of using proprietary tools that maybe not every reviewer has access to and maybe sh uh, for that reason alone cannot reproduce the results. And then there is a whole list of uh, computation steps, how you could use pipelines and scripts to automate the whole paper, all the results, all the intermediate figures. And it's quite easy to imagine people being like um, exhausted by looking at this list alone. Particularly if you come from a domain that is not computer science or any computational field, and you get presented with this list uh, mentioning Docker files, virtual machines, readme's, uh, Amazon Web Services, Binder, whatever, you might just be like, how the <laughs> am I supposed to do this? Um, so being a good open science citizen is hard, really hard sometimes, depending where you're coming from. And I have to confess that along the way, I have also made a lot of plunders. I didn't know any better. Actually, I dug through through my papers, and the first one that I submitted to to Phosphor G Nottingham, 2013, contained um, multiple QGIS uh, back then sextante models, and I, I still have the screenshots of them. And basically, I also used these uh, screenshots in a slightly modified fashion in the papers, and I also described. While well, you can find the code, uh, the models on GitHub, uh, which is still fine. You can almost find them still on, on GitHub nine years ago. But these model files, obviously, if you try to load them right now, you will be very out of luck because the model files from Sextant, obviously, they are not supported by QGIS free anymore. So like in most, uh, scientific work, once the project is over, the maintenance is usually also non-existent. And the same happened to my code. You cannot run this model anymore. Of course, you could try to go back, find a QGIS version um, 1.8 and try to run these things. Um, it might work but it's certainly not convenient for a reviewer or, or another scientist to try and go down that route uh, nine years later. So because I noticed these models, they, they kept on breaking. I try, uh, you then later on used a different approach. I tried to do just Python scripts, uh, processing scripts. But even with these, we had a change from Python 2 to Python 3. So this uh, print error, syntax error, is certainly one of the more benign things that will be happening. Um, I'm sure there are many other things that are broken in the meantime with these scripts as well. So also reproduction here wouldn't be totally f uh, flawless. And my very latest attempts uh, have been now moving to Jupyter Notebooks, uh, even trying to make Docker files but still, we, I, we keep running into issues with images, with imports changing. So it's a constant process. We all make mistakes and we are all trying to improve. And that's what I hope to show you with these examples of my failures. Um, so 
let's keep on improving. And I'm super happy that there are so many people who try to improve and who share their steps towards um, making this situation better. Just yesterday, Robin, for example, published a whole new set of Docker containers for all kinds of geocomputation tasks, whether they're with QGIS, with Python, or with R, of course. And of course, this is in a rather early stage, but I think this is exactly what we should be trying to do. Maybe we can build a community around a set of standard containers. We can should try to make this work to make our work more reproducible. Another thing that just happened yesterday, because of course phosphor G happens at, again at the same week as GI science, is that the reproducibility paper of Frank and also uh, Daniel, I think, uh, won the best paper award at GI science this year. Congratulations for that as well. Um, they also find that as usual, the still a lot of improvements to be made so far. The most of the papers cannot be reproduced with a reasonable effort, but at least we have identified the issue and we know how it can work, for example, from HR to improve the situation. So I was wondering, maybe we should also look for ne the next phosphor G at a reproducibility effort for the academic track. I think that would be a worthwhile thing to consider and I hope that maybe some of you think the same and we could get something moving for the next year. Because being an open science citizen is hard, so let's be kind to each other and let's try to work together to make the situation better. Thank you. Well, well, so thank you, Anita, for sharing this topic so interesting. In let's see um, if you have a question for Anita. Oh, there are a lot of questions. Well, <laughs> first, <laughs> uh, first question. This an acceptable combo for an open geoscientist paper published on an institutional repo as DOE, search code, and script other artifacts, etc on GitHub, GitLab, and data, etc. That's absolutely a great start, I would say. As I mentioned, uh, it's, it's really a spectrum. Uh, so if you already have the data and the source code somewhere where it's uh, findable, uh, where people can actually access it without having to write you an email and waiting for your reply, that's already a, a great start. It might still be the case, like I showed in my examples, that it's not really um, without issues to actually get the code to run. So, of course, if it's code that has to be built uh, because it's probably not uh, executable on all machines, uh, then it can get harder and harder. And that's why I think uh, we, we might want to work with images which the reviewers or the uh, our peers can just download and use directly instead of having to deal with the source code and the data, maybe download them from different sources. It's just a slightly inconvenient, but it's certainly much, much better than what most of the papers right now have. Hmm. So, well, <laughs> the next question. And someone on the chat said, poor replication is an utopia. What do you think about that? That's probably right, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't strive to achieve uh, something that's close to it. And also, I'm not even sure if replication is always the, the ultimate uh, goal either, because in many other cases, it might be that you just want to uh, be able to reuse the same code and apply it to your own data set as well. So I think the, the real gold standard is if you don't just make something that works and that enables someone else to reproduce your results, but that they can then actually also transfer and use on their own data as well. So yeah, pure 100% uh, reproducibility is, is super hard, uh, but there's also more than just reproducibility. Yes, yes. 
And do you think academia should be better set up for reproducibility? Their limited profession academic benefits existing beyond publication? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I bet I'm preaching to the choir here, but of, of course we all have to weigh our options and our priorities here because I can either spend time on making my code really nice and reusable or I can sit down and write a second paper. And realistically, mm -hmm. currently with our benefit system, I have much more incentive to, to write a second paper instead of making one that is really great and reproducible and where the code is reusable for all kinds of different people. So scientific uh, software engineering certainly needs to be uh, elevated. There need to be many more incentives to actually work on something and also to work together to not have every lab developing their own stuff because it's their pet project and they don't want anyone else to also uh, play around with it. Okay. Um, oof, there are a lot of questions. <laughs> um, we are discussing about repro uh, reproducibility from the data and computational side of the view. That other initiative you think are I didn't um I I lost the question. Do, do, do. Ah, okay. The other question. Many times journaly do not have find somewhere review of year. Imagine search someone that must carry adult all that. Uh, how do you see reviews of scientific papers carrying out all that step? So if I understand you correctly, the question is um, if, if reviewers are actually trying to reproduce the results in a paper. Mm. Yeah, okay. Uh, so in my experience, most of them are not. Uh, for also understandable reasons, um, it takes a very, very long time and a lot of effort to, to try and reproduce the results. And before you actually start doing it, it's also impossible to estimate how long it will take you. If you are an established scientist and you are experienced with reviewing papers, you know if the paper has 15 or 16 pages and it's not too densely written, it will take you this amount of time probably to, to finish the review. But if you start going down the rabbit hole of trying to reproduce the results, it could take you anything from one afternoon to two weeks to actually finish it and you have no guarantee that it will be finished. You usually also have no incentive to do it because what Agile is doing is really the exception because in Agile you actually have a publication that is your review report and you can say, look, I, I did this, I reviewed this paper, uh, give me some acknowledgement at least for it, even if it's not a big one. But for most journal reviews, they are double blind or at least the, the reviewers are blinded uh, nobody will ever find out the, the effort that you put into it. And I think that's very uh, demotivating in the current system. Okay. So, well, one other question. And um, this. Well, re reproducibility is associated with having code and data set together in some repository, but data set distribution may be restrictive or data set may be hard. What are alternatives for this? In my experience, if the data sets are too large for even services like Figshare, then I'm not sure what researchers uh, can really do. Um, for data sets that are too large for GitHub, but not uh, too large for Figshare, I think it's acceptable in the sense of reproducibility to include a download uh, from a separate location, that being Figshare, uh, to actually get the data together. And that's also what I implemented in my uh, Docker file for the notebook that I showed before. It actually um, builds the container with the code from GitHub and then it downloads the data from Figshare to uh, integrate it into the uh, container that it's building. And, and I think that is okay, but really if the data sets are too big for those large public repositories, uh, I think your institution uh, should figure it out. Um, 
but that's certainly an issue that we will have to deal with in the future for the really large data sets, yeah. Okay. Um, so the last question, because we have a lot of questions. Um, well, we are discussing, um, ah, pardon. Repos repositability is associated with have a code data set together some. That's the same one. Oh, that's the same question. Sorry, sorry. So this. How could we set up a for sheet code review team? That's an excellent question. And I think we should take that to the socializing later on. I don't have the full answers. Uh, I only know we need at least a sizable team like HL, seven or eight people who are really committed and willing to get their hands dirty. Um, we also have to see, of course, how many papers there would be to review, because I don't think that one person can do more than one or two reviews realistically. Mm. So we are at time. And thanks so much. Thanks, Anita. And um, well, see you on the next for for she maybe for sure so well thank you and to see you on the next for for she anita thank you see you later bye, bye.